So the summary of the talk, let me just read it here. I talked to you, talk about in order for an attacker to steal from you, they need persistent access. This means ensuring that their C2 is reliable and resilient to take down. That's the main reason why over 90% of malware uses DNS for command and control and exfiltration. The good news is that this persistence is something we can use against the attackers in order to find their accesses and then improve how we respond. In this session, uh, Todd, We'll explain a new approach that goes beyond simply blocking and dropping malware C2. Attendees will learn how to speak malware in order to better respond when an attacker targets them. And we'll be doing a Q&A after. If anybody has any questions, I'll grab a mic, reach up to you guys after the talk, and we'll get some questions answered. If there's no questions, I'm going to turn it over to Todd to talk about malware. Hi there, I'm, I'm Todd. Um, thanks. So I, I'm from St. Louis, and last year we held our first uh, B-Sides, and the, the number of people in this room was bigger than all of the people that showed up to our B-Sides. So it's, um, it's really great to be here. Um, last year, about 50% of our attendees in, in B-Sides St. Louis were students. Um, so how, how many uh, in the room are, are students now? Oh, awesome. OK, I, you guys are all camouflaged. That's great, welcome. Um, I, so one of the things I wanted to start off with um, is I've been in security for 20 years. Um, and if you wanna talk about different paths in security, um, you know, and you're gonna hear some stories about some fun things that I've done in, in 20 years, um, I love to talk about that stuff. So please find me after the talk at the happy hour tonight. Um, and you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk about that with you. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about, um, it's, it's, it's more of an idea piece, right? I'm not going to hand you a piece of technology at the end of the talk or send you to a GitHub where you can download our software. Um, I'm, I'm going to work on some ideas with you and um, I, I'm going to need your brain's participation um, uh, throughout the whole talk. So I, I'm, I'm Todd, I'm, I'm one of the founders and uh, CTO at, uh, at Strongarm. Uh, we are headquartered in the Boston area, which is how I ended up here. Um, so we're up in Wakefield, and um, the reason we are up in Wakefield is um, uh, so I, I was uh, I was a Purdue guy, uh, and I studied at Sirius, uh, Gene Spafford's research center. Um, and my story on how I came into security was I was walking by a lecture hall like this, and um, uh, somebody was talking about Kerberos um, inside inside the room. Um, and uh, so I just kind of wandered in because, you know, it sounded interesting. It was a, a cool name and a cool thing, actually. Um, Kerberos is a really interesting protocol. And so I wandered in, and these grad students had figured out a weakness in ticket granting, in the, in the ticket granting ticket process, um, which is like, that's, that's the holy grail of, um, of Kerberos. If you, can, if you can get tickets, you win. And at that point, I was hooked. So um, I, I, I listened to the talk, I was just enthralled. I really got into crypto and um, the system side of security. Um, and then uh, my, my goal in life was to go to NSA and be a code breaker, but um, that didn't work out for, for a variety of reasons. And so I ended up at MITRE, uh, which is headquartered in uh, Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, at MITRE, I... Um, my first job was writing forensics tools for the Defense Department. What, was, what is now the Defense Cybercrime Center um, uh, was D D the Forensic Center back then. And um, I did 15 plus years of active incident response. At, at one point, um, I was on the other end of a, of a connection with, with bad people. And so um, I uh, split my time between real world incident response stuff and doing research. And um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the research we've done today and uh, what we've turned into a product. So I left MITRE two and a half years ago and uh, started a company um, called Strongarm. And that's um, the, the MITRE is, uh, MITRE in Bedford is our connection to, to Wakefield. So I, I, I'm an Irishman and I, I, I'll tell stories the whole time. Um, I, I'll, I, I, I won't really refer much to, to the slides. So. I, um, I was working on a team doing incident response, and we had an, uh, an, a set of analysts, um, brilliant people, and um, I was their tool builder type. So I, I was Q branch for these for the, these individuals, and we built custom tools to track um, 
persistent and um, highly capable um, uh, attackers. They were yeah, uh, um, well funded. So the, the, one day we found um, that uh, um, someone not good was accessing an unsecured web app that we had, had been running. And this was like 2003, 2004. So, you know, web apps without user IDs and passwords, that it wasn't an uncommon thing. Um, and it turns out that this web app stored some pretty sensitive information. Um, so um, what we did, our response to that, was um, I, I'll go from left to right on the slide. So what the attacker did is on, on, on your left, and what we did is on the right. So um, one of the crazy things we did back then was uh, put filtering on what domains could talk to the web server. Um, so we think that it took the attacker about a week to circumvent that. Um, they simply proxied through the trusted domain. They figured out what it was and went through the trusted domain. And um, you know, so at that point, um, they broke in about a week later. About six months later, we found them. Um, so that's the time frame we're, we're working at here. Um, and so we're going to get them. We're going to make people get user IDs and passwords for this system. And so uh, that took us about three months worth of effort, um, a few hundred um, people hours uh, to, to implement that. Um, and the attackers uh, simply found a way to route around the process. They found a weakness that we didn't know of in, in, the, in how passwords were reset. Um, you simply had to have an email um, with a specific um, extension on it. And the password reset process would say, here's a new password. And so, um, you know, it took us, however, uh, um, you know, six, three to six months to implement that. And, you know, the attacker tried some stuff and they were back in within two weeks. Again, a year later, we found them back in the system. So we've got gaps in visibility. We've got um, asymmetry, right? So the attackers are, are spending a week and we're spending months. And so um, eventually we hardened this pass, this, the, the process to reset your passwords. And um, at that point, the attackers simply social engineered their way around it. And the stuff they did was choice. It was really nice work. Um, and you know, at, at that point, we're, we've, we've got to do something big. And so we implemented uh, smart cards. Um, and the cost for this program was staggering, staggering. Um, and the pain that it caused people, um, you know, this two-factor authentication thing was it, was, it wasn't like Bank of America made you do it back then. It was really painful to do. Users hate it. Security people are working, um, you know, we, we had, we, we, we put a lot of uh, um, time and money uh, into this program. And um, the attacker simply moved over to softer targets. So $100 million expenditure, you know, hand wavy, uh, um, uh, a hand wavy estimate, um, the attacker simply moved away from where we had protected over to a softer target. All they had to do was recalibrate themselves. And, you know, they probably took them a couple of weeks to, you know, make some decisions on how to do that and then go target some softer, some softer targets. So $100 million expenditure and a couple of weeks on the attacker part. So this, um, at, at this point, um, you know, we... We're starting to get some questions um, from, from the leadership. Sorry. There it goes. Man, my punchline, my whole punchline, right? So if you do the math, the defenders aren't going to win ever. It's getting, in fact, the chasm is getting worse. And so, you know, we've got, we've got uh, I, I worked in the military, so there's generals on the other end of the table, and they're asking us, well, it looks like all these technical things that you're doing, that they're not buying us anything. Um, and by this time, we, we knew who the attacker was. We had some, you know, some, some idea of what they were after. Um, we, we had an, an understanding of their level of sophistication simply from engaging them for seven years. Um, and, and so we thought through, like, th there's got to be a better way. Um, so I'd urge you... Um, I'm sure there, there are plenty of people who, who are, are in security. Um, uh, is, is your pro how are you dealing with this asymmetry in your security programs? 
You know, just think about that. Um, and so, uh, on the other end of the table, I didn't, I didn't have a good answer. And that stuff really bothers me when, when I don't have any, any perspective on a problem. So, um, let's do some research. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, so, a uh, show of hands, who in here is familiar with the cyber kill chain from Lockheed Martin? Okay, great. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to explain the, th the, the model um, for the rest of the audience, so please bear with me. But, and I'm going to show you a nuance that I think you'll really like. May, maybe you already know. So, the cyber kill chain is a, is a model for how attackers go after a target. And it starts with, with just that, a, a target. So an attacker is given a reason to break into something. They don't indiscriminately do it. Um, and in this case, it was intellectual property. Um, you may work in, a, in an intellectual property rich environment, um, so you may be targeted for that as well. Um, other things that we've seen are, um, if you work in a highly competitive industry, um, your competitors can hire people with less scruples to go break into your network and steal your customers from you. That's, that's one thing we've seen. Um, and of course, uh, the theft of money is, is everywhere. You know, ransomware, stealing credit cards, stealing your personal information, selling it on the black market, blah, 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 blah. So they have a target. Um, at that point, they decide to go after um, a set of those targets. Um, so they, they begin to build um, typically um, phishing emails um, that look very, very realistic. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, they will package up something that goes boom, an exploit, uh, you know, link to something to try and get you to take an action, those kinds of things. Um, so then installation, step exploitation, uh, step four, that's when, when the boom happens. Um, installation of their initial package, and then, then they start to embed themselves like a tick. And so, um, you know, you, your, your victim is now... Um, uh, uh, talking to them, and um, the bad, you know, the the attacker um, can now start to take action on on what they're whatever they're targeting, be it intellectual property um, or your customer database or money. And so, um, what what I think is cool and what might be uh, nuanced for some of you, some of you that understand the kill chain is this timeline column, and this is what we paid most attention to. So at this point, we were spending all of our time in here. And if you think about it, most security tools spend their time in here. They're trying to watch for this boom. But it happens in a matter of seconds. So if you don't get it the first time, you lose. And then the attacker parks and they start to you know, just get comfortable. Might move laterally. I'm going to move over here. Park, my, park some new malware over there. Um, uh, begin to look like an administrator. That's a classic classic technique, so they start to get domain credentials, and then they become part of your system administration team, and, and all kinds of other fun stuff like that. And then they start sending emails as you, and, and then, then things really get fun. But um, very few people spend any time um, working here. And we got all the time in the world, months. Um, and back then, it was over a year. And I've seen 12 times in the three-year mark. So attackers who had access to a network for three years before they got caught. Um, so we got all kinds of time in the world um, to work on this. So let's, let's do that. And um, that's what we did. So another, uh, sorry for the established security people in the audience. Um, but this is what malware command and control looks like, um, in an essence. In general, it always starts with the victim. And the victim says, I am here. I have broken in, I'm, I've landed on Todd's laptop, and Todd is part of this work group, and here's the, you know, here's where the, the malware is loaded, uh, what version of um, you know, the operating system, um, what network shares are attached, those kinds of things. And then the attacker gets to say something back. And so normally, this is what we call a smash and grab operation. So they get in, and then they'll take everything that um, was on, on this, this particular system, just to figure out where they landed. And in a, in a highly sophisticated um, operation, they'll hand that off to an analysis team, and the analysis team will pick through what they've got access to and say, I want more of that. 
And so I'm a, I'm a big music nerd. And so, um, you know, they're, they're, maybe their target is a, a drum machine from the 80s. Um, and so uh, they, the, the attacker then searches um, for um, these terms, ADSR envelope. And um, the malware responds back with, I found a document that matches what you want. And the attacker says, oh, okay, give me that, please. And um, then they, you know, the documents come down. And then at that point, they, they kind of settle in. Um, they know where they are. Uh, may do a little bit of lateral movement um, to establish themselves further in the network and, and those kinds of things. And so um, I'm going to take a drink. Unfortunately, what we, were, what we would see, um, and I was, I was mostly a network guy, I did a lot of work in IDSs and firewalls, and what this looks like to an IDS is this. And so I'm sitting at the other end of the table, and I have to answer, okay, who is it? What have they taken? Um, and where are they? And this don't tell me that. I can say they're there. If I'm lucky, I'll know that they've gotten, you know, like a domain credential. And then I can say, well, they took everything. Um, uh, that's, that's about the best I can do. And so what we did, um, well, may, maybe we can hack the malware. Uh, so we did. And it was, it was a, a blast. And so what we did was we, we did a, a man in the middle. I'm sure you guys are all um, familiar with uh, breaking SSL and doing SSL man in the middles. I have philosophies on that that I like to debate, so if you'd like to argue with me afterwards, um, please. Um, so, but what we did was built a man in the middle for the malware. And so uh, we would use indicators compromise, you know, figure out uh, our, our specialty was uh, their figuring out where their servers were, their command and control servers. And then what we see here is, hey, I'm on Todd's computer, and we intercept this, and we can apply a policy here. So not only do we get to see it, we get to control what they're doing. And in most cases, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. You can report that out. Um, and so the attacker would then um, begin to try to download everything. And we could give them back. We could give them back what they asked for. We could also give them back um, an error, which is most commonly what risk-averse people do. Um, we could put things in this channel. I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. Um, and so, so on and so forth. And, and this visibility really allowed us to go from, um, let's see if this works, from this, in order to, uh, from, from this kind of a picture, um, and now if I'm sitting at the end of the table, I can say, well, we know that they were targeting um, this kind of information. And they wanted to download these kinds of files. Um, and there's also some technical information that you can see inside the malware um, that helps you do poor man's attribution. And so there's a, there's a lot of you know, goodness here. Um, but it was all technical stuff, right? We really didn't get any closer to the, um, to the, to the human side of understanding really um, why and um, uh, giving any other options for protection, right? We found the malware, that's good. We're gonna reduce dwell time, but that's not, that's not really interesting stuff for a, a, you know, an, an executive um, who's just been, been attacked and you know, maybe their, their, all their customer data was stolen. So um, maybe, maybe we can hack the attackers themselves. And I'm not talking about getting on the keyboard and going and blowing up their stuff on their end. Like, let's get into their brain. And so, does anybody know about the farewell dossier? Anyone? Okay, this is going to be great. You, you'll love it. So we hooked up with some social scientists. And they were social scientists in the, in the, in the purest form. They knew very little, little technical um, stuff, which is kind of how we wanted it. And um, they introduced us to this, to this wonderful story. So um, farewell was the name of a Soviet defector in the 80s. Um, and the French named, named him. And at one point, um, as the defection was happening, 
uh, the French premier came to President Reagan and said, um, we have a Soviet defector, and uh, they've told us all about um, the um, Soviets' troubles building pipelines in Siberia. Um, they, they, have it, they found oil, but they don't know how to move it. The Canadians, with us, we know how to move it. So the Soviets had implanted um, a bunch of KGB agents into um, this company that was building and operating pipelines in Canada in order to steal from them. And so the CIA took, got on a plane and went to Ottawa and um, told, um, man, I, I know the, the Canadian equivalent of the, the CIA, um, national security, that, so the Canadian equivalent of the CIA. Um, and you know, their first response was, okay, well, we got all the names here, let's go round them up. And they said, no, 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 no. We want you to give them this. And so um, the, uh, you know, the, the Canadians placed all these documents um, throughout this organization. They're all paper documents, this was the 80s. Um, and um, the, the Soviets took them back to Moscow. And about a year later, there was a catastrophic failure in the pipeline. And, you know, so you might, you might count that as a win. Um, but the ultimate win, um, even, even, more, even more so than that, was the, um, the KGB began to distrust the information that they had stolen from the West. And that is more powerful than, than you know, any, anything. And so they, they, they started to purge um, and revalidate and do, you know, um, and revalidate everything that they've stolen. Um, and so, if, if, especially if you work in an intellectual property heavy environment, you know, think about that as a protection mechanism um, for yourselves. Because I will tell you, um, based on experience, the, the attackers aren't gonna stop. You have something they want, and they're gonna come steal it from you, one way or another, be it via a computer or implanting a spy in your organization. They're gonna figure out a way to, to come after you, so you have to come up with some clever ways to, um, to respond. And um, so we did a bunch of research on this. And so it's uh, what we did. Um, this is an experiment. I, I don't um, suggest you go run out and do this on your network today. Um, I'm trying to uh, implant some ideas in your head. And so what we did was uh, pitted a red team against a blue team. The red team's job was to have an understanding of the blue's plans, basically to predict what, what the blue team was going to do. Um, and I'm not talking about um, like a computer blue team here. Um, these were military operations in this case. Um, and Blue's job wasn't to protect the computer network. It was to ensure the success of the mission. They had a job to do, and it was, it was part of their job to ensure that, that, things, that their mission was successful. Um, through an understanding of where the attackers had come into, things like email boxes, you know, computers that could steal information, um, the red team was fed a steady stream of, of uh, both true and misinformation. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, the, the were, were fully tricked into the story um, that, they were, um, that, that, that they were fed. There is an awesome talk by the MITRE people that they, the, our, our co-researchers on this wrote a book um, and have given uh, talks uh, throughout the country, um, public talks on this. And um, let me know if you want um, URLs and, and whatnot, and I'll, I'll supply those. And so one of my favorite parts of this, um, of, of doing the experiment, was we had the social scientists with us, and they, they were deception experts. That's, that's what their background was. Um, and I can remember the first time we started talking about all of the access points that an attacker has on an organization. Um, and when I told them that if they put something in an email box, this particular email box, because we found out the account, the account was compromised, that the attacker would get it. And they would know that the attacker would get it. So like their eyes lit up and they started building these kinds of things into the plan. Um, and these were the engagement points that we identified and used throughout the experiment. Email boxes are awesome. If you find a popped email account, um, it's a real opportunity to 
um, uh, to, to give something back. Um, <laughs> documents that are on, on shared drives um, and uh, that are on uh, people's laptops as well. Um, there was a, a couple of instances of, of uh, giving, giving back there. Uh, and then we actually had a totally failed experiment. Um, maybe I'll talk about that if I have a little extra time. On, on web apps, but um, web apps are also a real nice opportunity when you find a popped account um, to let them use the account for a little while so that you can um, figure out wh what they're after and where they're coming from, because that's another thing that you get to see. Um, and so by combining, um, you know, being able to give access to information, um, by, by uh, giving uh, information back to the attackers that was um, well formulated by, by the blue team, um, the, 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 the research was a, was a big success. So um, I'll talk to you about uh, one last thing. Um, Maybe we can hack our own organizations. Um, kind of sticking with this theme of getting into people's heads. And again, I'm, I'm not talking about like breaking into your own people's like pen testing and those kinds of things. Um, so 90, still to this day, I, I think this number is true. 90% of attacks start with a fish. Um, despite new approaches coming out, this is tried and true. So the Bianco, the top of the pyramid of pain, um, this is their TTP. Phishing is a TTP. And if you can get out ahead of it, you, you're, you're going to do better. So let's work on this. Um, I have a technical degree for, um, for better or for worse, right? It served me well in some regards and very poorly in others. Um, and I, this, this whole user education thing, talking to your users about fishes, um, was, uh, I blew it off when, when I was a pup. And, um, you know, that's, that's an actual statement for me. There's no way that will work. Um, well, it turns out it was really, really wrong. Um, talking to users about phishing um, really works, like getting into their heads. And I, I have an, another fun story to share here on, on this one. Um, so start with the executives. And uh, there's a reason for that. So um, we, we had a bunch of, uh, I think it's called whale fishing, whaling, whaling, that's what it is. I'm not good with my lingo. Um, uh, so we had a bunch of executives get targeted um, and uh, one of them clicked. And um, so we went to have a conversation with them and it turns out that they weren't the only ones targeted. Um, but that conversation turned into a conversation not between us security people and the executive the executives started talking amongst themselves. Um, they, they started um, comparing notes. Hey, I got this kind of a message last week, um, and I found it. Uh, I told the security people. Um, the, but the kicker, the best of all, my absolute favorite, is um, they began comparing, um, like counting, like this is an executive in charge of plans or logistics or operations. These aren't, aren't security people. Um, but they, they built it into their, um, into their daily routine, weekly routine, to understand how their organization has been targeted by phishing. And then they compared it with the other executives. So my programs got phished five times this week. How many times did your programs get phished? And it was by this attacker. And here's the, here's the new thing that they've added. Um, well, another, another fun fact. Um, public release on Monday, it was used in a phishing attack on Tuesday, right? Hey, look at this new press release from the organization, the PDF with a boom in the middle. And so um, make a game out of it. Uh, get people talking to each other. Um, get people on the staff, not security people, talking to each other. Um, reporting to you um, as, as, as security practitioners. Um, the, the data that you can get out of these phishing emails is gold. Get your, be nice to your people. Don't shame them when they get a phishing email. Don't shame them when they click, please, because that's, that's Pavlovian, that's bad, badness. Um, get them talking to you about it. Um, build that rapport and get everybody in the organization working together. Um, because I, uh, I have seen that work and 
um, it's a it, it's really a win. So this is about the end of the uh, the structured talk that I have. Um, my goal today was to uh, implant some ideas. So if you guys have some fun ideas uh, that you'd like to um, share with the audience on um, different ways you can get in the heads of bad people, good people, um, I, I'd love to have the conversation. And I, I can share one more story if, uh, um, if, the, if the, you guys don't want to talk. I can do that. Yes. Yes. Please. So my name is Darwin, I'm president of the Cybersecurity Club at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, one, one initiative that we have is uh, cyber hygiene, a cyber hygiene awareness campaign where we post uh, very practical tips around campus, uh, graphically pleasing. But what, what we try to do is um, bring the language down to everyday language when it comes to phishing, passwords, uh, Whatever it may be, what do you think it would get to? Uh, what do you do? You think it would take to get the conversation started on the um, student level, just for not only for people who are seeking um, cybersecurity knowledge or uh, tips, but also like uh, around the whole entire campus. Um, in our first semester, we we've uh, we've gotten 68 members, and it's a pretty small liberal arts school where we don't have a undergraduate cybersecurity program, so it's like. I feel like we're doing um, a lot, but we could do more because everybody's vulnerable. So yeah. I, I, I was interested in seeing what your take on it would be. Oh, man. Um, I have a couple of ideas. So uh, it has to be about making a connection with, with whoever you're targeting. Um, uh, if, make, it, make it real to them. Um, and so what, one thing that's fun is do you, do you have a relationship with IT? Like if people talk to you, do people talk to you or IT about um, the fishes that they get? Um, I've had a couple professors come up to me, but um, no, nobody from the student side. And uh, one thing I also wanted to add is I intern at the think tank on campus, so I feel like I sort of have a, a cross influential uh, platform where I could, uh, I don't know, kind of have a bit more influence. So for October week, what we were thinking about doing is doing a fishing Yeah, so you got to get started somewhere, right? You got to have the spark. Yeah. And then what happens once, once you start to get people, to, like you'll become the fishing guy, yeah. right? And people start talking to you. And um, you, you, you know, from the, from the uh, assessment, from the fishing assessment, you know, you'll have some stories of how many people clicked. And from that, people start talking to you about, hey, I got this brand new UPS um, uh, phishing email. Um, I didn't click on it, but my buddy over there did, and they, they, they got their, you know, their whole computer taken over by ransomware. And so you, you'll be able to relay those, those stories um, to everybody on campus. And you know, at that point, you can, you can pick and choose the, the, um, the best one for um, the, the person that you're talking to. Um, you know, if, they're, if they're a rampant clicker, um, there's, that's one set of stories. If they're you know, the, um, in this think tank, ostensibly, you're, you're building cool stuff, right? That someone would want to steal. And so that's, that's a different story. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome to security. <laughs> oh, and I, sorry, I have another, I have another uh, um, anecdote here. Um, so the, uh, the, the simple down to earth, um, there's a couple of people I can refer you to. So um, the San Diego Union Tribune has begun a nationwide um, cybersecurity publication um, that's targeted at um, uh, lay people. So uh, people that don't work in security. Um, and it's very down to earth, um, very, very um, easy to read. Um, and then for a more, um, a more sophisticated uh, read, there's a guy named Michael Santarcangelo who writes for CSO and he's, he's got a couple of other really great programs on, it's called Security Straight Talk. Um, and it's, it's just about making connections and ensuring that uh, people understand the value of security and everything that they do. 
I think we got a we got a mic in the back, and then we'll go to the front. Hi. Hello. Oh, there. Hi. Uh, my name is David Sloan. I'm an IT manager at a software company in uh, Somerville, and uh, we started doing phishing tests last year. Uh, and uh, the thing that was most successful for us uh, was doing a super unfair phishing test. Uh, so it it looked a little bit like it was from the director of HR, uh, not exactly wrong email domain, but mostly looked like her thing. But it was about a uh, company retreat that was coming up that people were talking about a lot. Uh, it was uh, it was supposed to be in Florida. People were really concerned about Zika, uh, and. Uh, it was super unfair, like to make you click on this thing. 100% fair, man. Uh, so it's inbounds. It was, inbounds. well, we got a lot of people upset, but people either loved it or hated it. Uh, and that was the great thing. People talked about this thing for weeks. And nobody had ever talked about phishing before. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It's boring. Who cares? Go do your thing. Fix it. Save it. We don't want it. We have work to do. But it uh, engaging people in this thing they cared about. Uh, really, really, really raised awareness. And so I definitely encourage you to do the things that are unfair and be willing to make a few people upset. Definitely get buy-in where you need to. Don't you know, ruin your career or anything, but, uh, but be a jerk a little bit and, uh, and get people talking, like you're saying. Yeah, so the, I, I can't say it enough. Um, one of the things that pisses me off more than, more than anything in security, I'll, I'll suffice to say, is user shaming. Drives me nuts. If I hear any of you doing it, I'm going to stop you. And I will give you a lecture. Don't do it. It turns off the people that you're trying to work with. Um, do not make fun of them for clicking on phishing emails. Um, th these people are victims. They, they, they get chosen by an attacker. Um, and if you think they're dumb to click on a phishing email, well, your day may come. <laughs> Phone here. Um, you mentioned your shim layer, uh, SSL inspection between the malware oh and your gosh. cell. Yeah. You ever try throwing a, a malicious Word document back at them? You said, you know, documents was your example, download all the documents. Why not throw a bad macro in there somewhere? Oh, man. It, it's so, sure, you could do that, right? You could put a, you could put a PDF with a boom in it. Um, but it's so uninteresting to me. Um, and that's, that, that maybe that was me. Uh, you can put anything you want in these channels, right? Um, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, I don't think that you should go put documents with exploits on your shared drive or anything like that. Um, but for me, it was, I was trying to reach the pinnacle of, you know, of the, the pyramid of pain and, and really understand um, how the attackers were working against me and what they were after um, so that I could build security programs at what we call in the, in the military an operational level. So if I have a program that a nation state wants access to, I'm going to put more money into that program and less money into you know, the, the picnics website. Um, and that's really what I, was, what I was looking for. But you, man, you can put anything you want in this channel, especially if you live in a country without scruples. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, um, so I, I didn't talk to you at all about what I do. Um, so the, the question was, uh, it was about the strong arm product. Um, do you uh, deploy it and use it to find malware? Um, or is it something that we intend to leave behind? So um, w one of the nuances, I don't know if anybody caught it, but um, when, when the government got good at security, um, the bad people squirted over to enterprise and um, eventually went down to small businesses. And Strongarm is a security product for small and mid-sized businesses. So that's what I do. I help companies from 100 people to 500 people protect themselves. Um, and so to answer the question, um, Strongarm is um, awesome at finding malware um, that's embedded in a network. You know, as, long, as soon as the thing beacons, um, we find it and talk to it. That's, that's part of the, what the product does. Um, but uh, for our, especially for small businesses, they're, they're laden with clickers. And so l putting strong arm in and then uh, taking it out um, doesn't provide them any phishing um, or malvertising protection. Uh, protection. And um, that's, what, 
we, you know, that we try and move to the left side of the boom um, by protecting people from, um, from those kinds of attacks. Did I answer your question? Sort of. I mean, what I'm really getting to is, is it a tough sell for you, Bay, with the fact that the demand is another product? So that means every time somebody goes back to their Bank of America account, potentially an ad will see their watch. Oh, no, 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 no. So we don't, we don't do that. Um, I apologize if I, if I, um, uh, if, if that's, that was your understanding. So let me go back, and, and I, I didn't give you guys very good context there, that's, that stinks. Um, so, this only happens when we, um, when a victim tries to talk to a command and control server. All the rest of the traffic, you know, I, don't, I, I don't see it. So that's why, that's where we get um, scalability. I'm not building the proxy here, I'm uh, kind of, uh, but it's not a web proxy, right? <laughs> Um, and I'm not going to route everybody's web traffic through it and break SSL. In fact, I am an, a staunch opponent of breaking SSL. Um, that's, that's a beer conversation, though. Um, so this, this, what would happen here is um, if you have a, a database of indicators, as a perfect example, um, and you know uh, um, uh, where command, malware command and control servers have been set up, um, you add them to a, a DNS-based blacklist, and we use the DNS to uh, shunt the traffic over to Strongarm. That's how it works. Better? Well, okay. Yeah, for sure, for sure. How, like, how does this help at all? Kind of um, where everything is so that you can stay or leave? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, you guys can leave if you don't care about the story. But um, <laughs> we, so we, we actually tried to sell this, um, this whole man in the middle thing. Um, and uh, either people didn't care uh, because they just want to find out where they've been, you know, where their victims are and, and, and go get rid of them. Uh, or they would not accept the risk. We've actually had a bunch of people say, I cannot leave an attacker on my network, and I have some good responses for that, and they still weren't buying it. So what we did with the product is we split this stuff in half. Um, so our product today is uh, just the black hole. So we only see the victim um, talking, um, but we can still speak malware with it. So the victims, it, hey, I'm on Todd's computer, I'm over here, and we, we, have a, we, we hold the handshake open so that the attacker can't um, get access to the system. We now are its server. And in that channel, um, we, give it some we give the victim some stuff back um, so that it'll cough up a bunch of information about who it is. And that's how we uh, find the victim and help you remediate it quickly. And that's what most of our customers want, frankly. And then we've got some awesome ideas for the red side. Um, that we're going to do, if everybody knows what Shodan is, um, we're, we're going to do some cool stuff with um, Shodan and um, speaking malware. Uh, but that, that's coming later. Did I answer your question? Okay. Question in the front. Uh, Can we mic him? Oh, yeah. so I was gonna say it seems like you're a fan of handing back information to these attackers just to see kind of what you can get from them to learn about them? Oh, it was um, so much more than seeing what you could get. It was a right. well orchestrated, um, and, and that's it what seems the social, social kind of like your product is somewhat in the, you know, area of a honeypot. I was going to say, are there any honeypot um, pro projects or anything that you recommend checking out or? Yeah, so um, we had some colleagues um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of, uh, let's see, inbound honeypots. Um, and uh, we had some colleagues that were focused on, um, you know, taking, taking malware and, and double clicking on it and seeing what happened. And um, that, the, the challenge is, is um, if the environment's not good, right? If the, if the Outlook email box isn't full of email, um, the attackers know that, you know, pretty much instantly. Um, and then, then if, if you don't have that, you have to go make it, right? And everything has to be perfect. Um, and in fact, uh, why don't I tell my story as a response to your question? 
Um, so I got I got a couple minutes, and then I'll have to I'll have to get off the stage. Um, so we took strong arm, and we wanted to apply it to hacked um, uh, credentials. So for for a web app, um, we took the attacker and the, the credentials that we knew were owned, the passwords that was stolen, and we shunted them over to a system that we took control of and gave them the information that we wanted to give them. It was a total disaster. And um, first of all, you, gotta, you have to do this, right? You have to kind of duplicate real information, give, give, give them a little bit of fake stuff. Um, so it was really hard from a technical perspective. And then the thing absolutely fell apart when the attacker had two accounts. All they did was logged into the other account and validated that the information was correct. And then at that point, we, we just turned the thing off and, and walked away. And so um, from a honeypot perspective, we've done a bunch of work in that area. Um, but I, I still believe the, um, you know, this, this, this was somewhat successful um, when, we, when, we, uh, when, when we deployed it. And the, the deception social science stuff was, those were our two successes, and we had lots of research failures. Lots, because that's research, right? Okay, I think I can take one more question and I gotta get out. You're the boss, though. Jeez. Yeah. 